Hi everyone, it's Tuesday, happy hour Q&A with me. Hi, 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 hi. Sorry, I'm running a little late. Did everyone have a good weekend? Mother's Day? Do anything really unusual in this COVID climate? My husband got all excited. He went out early to try and like get fancy donuts. The line was way too long, so he gave up. Went and got other stuff, went and got flowers. He went and got a lot of stuff, but then he left everything for me to clean up. So even though the gesture was nice, the reality of it kind of like drove me crazy. Ooh, hi Liz. We're talking about facelifts today. Um, I guess we'll talk about kind of non-surgical and surgical. You guys can let me know which one's more interesting. I was thinking about it because there's like all kinds of non-surgical facelifts now. I'm sure you've heard of like um, vampire facelifts, um, the Madonna lift, thread lifts, um, using PRP or fat or fillers. And then, you know, obviously then there's the um, surgical facelift, but I kind of like all of them. Um, obviously I'm kind of entering into that age range where you know, stuff is starting to fall down the wrong way and you wake up in the morning and you're like, holy crap, what is that? I didn't have that before. And as you do the little like skin pull and you're like, that didn't used to happen, I swear. You know, I smile and like, oh man, what is this? What is this neck band? And every day there's something new and something more to chase. So maybe we can talk about that instead. If you have a preference, let me know. And then that way we can kind of direct this talk one way versus the other. Obviously, I'm always happy to talk about surgery. Love surgery. Love that we're just about starting to do surgery again in the safest manner possible, of course. Um, okay, but for the happy hour part, I kind of figured since it was Mother's Day and it's springy out, or at least in California, it was gorgeous this weekend. Um, so, and I had strawberries in my fridge. They so were doing a strawberry gin fizz or vodka. I guess you could do a vodka fizz if you don't like gin. I kind of like gin, but we're doing the family-friendly, all-ages version here, so I'm making mocktails. Um, okay, so I took a bunch of strawberries, um, and which, by the way, last year when, um, around this time, we went out and had strawberries at, at um, 12 Mech in, in uh, LA. Have you guys been there? It's pretty awesome, but they have a small, um, I don't know, like a cafe version next door called Petite Trois, but they served strawberries and it was just strawberries, I think with like a little bit of cream, but they were the most fantastic strawberries I have ever had. And I asked where they came from and they said they're from Santa Barbara from a place called Howl's and I guess they supply strawberries to a lot of the um, kind of like nice restaurants um, all around the country, but they are so, so good. These strawberries, unfortunately, are nowhere near as good. So I'm gonna doctor them a little bit so, I don't know why I can't open this. Um, so, I took the strawberries, I'm macerating them, which means I just put a little, them in a little bit of sugar to bring out some of the sweetness, and then I'm going to mash them up. Okay, so they've been sitting in sugar for a couple of minutes now. Um, I went to BevMo today because I needed the rose water. I was actually looking for like a Persian market, but then I didn't want to risk going there and it not being open. So I went to Bevno and they just bring it right to you at the door. So that's cool. This is rose water. Um, I tend to find this stuff a little bit cloying. Ooh, very rosy, but just need a little bit. So I'm going to use my mortar and pestle and just going to mash my strawberries that have been sitting in sugar for about five, seven minutes. Oh, you know, you get the idea. There's a lot more work than I feel like doing right now, so I'm just gonna kind of mush them around. <laughs> but basically, I think if I were really motivated to make this awesome, um, then I would try a little bit harder. But <laughs> for now, this will do. Okay, so I smashed around my strawberries, 
made a mess. Gonna get some ice in my baby bottle shaker. Okay, so it says to put my strawberries in here along with the gin if you're gonna use it. Um, a little bit of the rose water. Again, I'm kind of scared of stuff that's way too sweet, so I'm gonna err on the side of caution. And my recipe says to go for um, half a teaspoon for one serving, so we'll just start with that. Woo! Hi, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday. Okay. Oh, I didn't know I could have guests on my video. Well, we should do that. That'd be fun. Um, okay. So now I'm just going to scoop a bunch of these pretend they're mashed strawberries into my cup. And again, just making a big hot mess on my cutting board. But who cares? I'll clean it up afterwards. Okay, strawberries in my baby bottle. And then lime juice. Here's my lime. I love doing these Tuesday or Thursday sessions because that means I get to get rid of all of this fruit that otherwise just gets really moldy in my kitchen because I always intend to use it and then I don't. Okay. So, thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm making strawberry gin fizz without the gin. So strawberry fizz, I guess, with lime and rose water. Okay. I don't know. I feel like this is taking a lot more effort than I thought it would. <laughs> um, you know, so in the in the grown up version, it's gin or vodka, and then you I'm gonna shake it around with your cocktail shaker. I'm not adding any liquor, so I'm just gonna put a little club soda in here. And hope it doesn't explode on me. Again, yay, baby bottles. It's so useful. Okay. I have a feeling I'll want more lime because I always want more lime. I'm just going to put it out in my glass and top it off with more Perrier or whatever club soda type of thing you want. It would probably be pretty if you had some sort of um, garnish. But again, maybe I could do a lime here. Let's see. Let me make an effort for you guys since we're trying to do this all pretty and stuff. Here we go. Woohoo. Uh, I have to make my husband one too because he has to take care of the baby while I'm doing all this stuff. Yay! Hey, that looks kind of legit, huh? Hmm. Not bad. Would be better with better strawberries, like I said. I'm going to let these strawberries sit for a while before I make his, and then maybe it'll be really good. All right, on to our topic of the evening. So what do you guys think? Should we talk about non-surgical facelifts or surgical facelifts? Anyone have a vote? Hi, Crystal. Make it a double, a double, no non-gin fizz. <laughs> yeah, my husband cannot handle liquor. This is a true fact. Okay, let's see. Faces, faces. Let's talk about faces. So last week we talked about eyes and kind of forehead. So we'll move down. Um, when we talk about faces and facelifts, most of the time what people are concerned about are the mid mid face so that means like from the eyes to the upper lip and then the lower face which is kind of from here down to the chin area and most of the time when people start to worry about the way their face looks it's because the fat pads and the ligaments that held those fat pads in place have started to weaken to droop to fall um, the skin loses its elasticity. If you go and look back on your Facebook or whatever, you know, say 10 years, 20 years, and look at how you looked at that time, just pay particular attention to, you know, your cheeks, um, to your nasal labial folds, to your nasal jugal grooves. These are all big terms, huh? To your perioral mounds, to your jowls to your pre-jowl sulcus. Again, big fancy plastic surgery terms. And basically, these are the things that happen as we age. Uh, also happens if you lose a lot of weight, um, but these are the things that concern people. So again, if you look at yourself in the mirror versus a photo of yourself about 
10 years ago, you'll notice, and I notice this, I look at my driver's licenses from a couple of years ago versus now, and I see that, you know, where my cheeks used to be up here, they're now starting to come down. I notice that my face is not as, you know, round as it used to be. Um, I notice that, you know, I'm starting to get these hollows here so you can see it on my face. Again, this is because my cheek fat is starting to fall. You can see it's here. As it continues to fall, you're going to notice that your nasal labial fold, which is this crease here, starts to become deeper and heavier. And this is the time when a lot of people will come by and say, I need filler here, I need filler here, I need filler here. And then they'll also say, I need filler here, I need filler here, I need filler here. Uh, and that is not true. Um, oh, okay, yes, I'm happy to talk about surgical too. Uh, <clears throat> any facelift, be it surgical or non-surgical, requires repositioning, repositioning of the deeper structures of the face. Now this can include uh, muscle, um, what we call the smas, which is like a strength layer that's deep to the skin, but it's not fat and not muscle. Um, it also requires uh, repositioning or adding and subtracting of the fat in the face so that could involve um, adding fat like to the cheeks doing lipo to the jowls here or to the neck down here all things that we're trying to treat in order to restore and rejuvenate what we used to have now the biggest complaint that people come with when they're talking to me about an actual facelift like a surgical facelift are twofold one it's jowls so jowls are these little poochy sagging type things that you see a lot of people with and then you'll see a little hollow in front of it okay and this is very common pretty much everyone will get this over the course of their lifetime the jowls uh, are kind of a multi-lobe structure again it's fat it's suspended just about here and again as everything comes down it tends to lose definition and start to drape itself over the edge of your jawline. So instead of having a nice sharp jawline, all of a sudden you have this jaw that starts to hang down below and you say, oh, what is that? And you stand in front of the mirror and you make this motion and you pull everything up and you say, oh, I wish my face looked like that. I actually had a patient at our Upland office and she came in and she said, I want you to make me look like this. And she goes, she goes and she tips her neck back and everything fell out. She said, look how beautiful that looks. And I said, hey, that's fantastic. Um, you know, I think everyone should do that and take a picture of themselves and they'll know what they'll look like after a facelift. So if you want to, you could try that. Anyhow. All right. So jowls and then the neckline. So, you know, when you're young, the neck has this nice 90 degree angle. We call it the cervical mental angle. Uh, with age and with losing the laxity and with a drop and increase in fat here, you see a lot of people start to get, you know, like a waddle. It may be fat, it may be skin, it may be muscle banding. Uh, it could be all three of them, one, two, or just one. Uh, during the consultation, I'm going to look at your mid face and I'm going to look at your lower face. If you come into me and all you keep doing is this motion, then I will tell you right away, you're not going to get that result without having surgery done. The only way you can do this is by mechanically tightening and lifting the structures. So let's talk about surgery. We can do another session on non-surgical some other time. Okay, so facelift, for the most part, when you see a surgeon, refers to the lower third of the face. Um, you can have a mid face lift, but this is a little bit more specific. It's for people who say, you know, I'm fine with the way my jaw and neck looks, but I feel like this needs to come up. So that's a separate discussion. Let's focus on the lower third since that's the most common. Now, facelift from the outside, all you really see are maybe very, very faint scars around the ears you will not see anything that we do deep to the skin, which is the most important part. All you think of is, you know, when I pull my face back like this, is this what I will look like? The answer is yes and no. The suspension is deep to the skin, like I said, in that aponeurotic fascia, which is called the SMAS. Now, if you go and do your research online, you're going to see a whole number of different types of facelifts. You will see a SMAS plication. You will see a SMAS ectomy. You will see a SMAS 
plane or a smash flap. You will see a deep plane. You'll see a composite and you'll say, what are all these things? Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. All you have to know is that the deep structures need to be lifted and secured in a better position. And your surgeon, if this is a board certified reputable person who understands your anatomy should be able to tailor the treatment to what you need and should be able to get you a good 10 to 15 years result out of it. So I never tell people that you'll get more than that out of it. And very realistically in the Southern California sun, unless you are religious about staying out of it or protecting yourself from it, you'll probably get like an eight to 10 year result from a facelift. Um, it's not a bad idea if you're worried about it and thinking about it, to get a consultation early. It's much easier to do a small lift now than it is to do a major overhaul five or 10 years down the road just because you say, oh, it's not so bad. But by the time it is really bad, well, then it's really bad. Okay, so I know you wanna know about the surgery part. All right, scars. So I put my scars inside the ear, behind the tragus here, okay? You'll see people with scars in front of the ear but I find these really obvious. I don't want to be able to see someone's scar from a facelift. I feel like that's kind of embarrassing. I want to be able to wear my hair tucked behind my ears. I want to be able to wear my hair up. And I want to be a male and have a neck or facelift and not show my scars. So, like I said, I hide it inside the ear. This is the most important part. And then I follow the crease of the earlobe here and then I go behind the ear in the crease itself, okay? Up here, I may go slightly in front of the hairline or in the hair itself, depending on where your sideburns are. Um, this allows me access to both this portion of the face and the entire neck. So surgery is done under sedation, which means that you get a nice little cocktail by the vein and then you get kind of sleepy, but there's no breathing tube. So it's not general anesthesia. Um, my last patient and I, we actually just joked through the whole surgery. She and I chatted, she, she said she remembers everything, but she said it was fine. It was an okay experience. Um, so then I use a lot of numbing solution, very similar to what I use in liposuction. It's just a local numbing medicine and it allows me to control the amount of bleeding that happens in the face and also kind of what we call hydro dissect. So it does a little bit of the work for me. And once I put that numbing medicine in, I let it sit for a little bit until it's taken effect. And then I make my incision. So I make my incision, do, 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 boop, lift it up and I lift the skin up. You know, it sounds kind of scary, but you lift the skin up to the portion that I want and it exposes that smash layer, the layer that will do the actual lifting. Now for me, I like, for younger people, I usually like to plicate, which just means that I tighten without cutting. Um, if you're very heavy jowled or heavy necked, then I will cut a portion of this. I use vectors that allow the lift portion to be kind of up and posterior. And then there's a lot of suturing involved. Um, I like to do extra focus on the corner of the mouth and the jowl to lift up in this direction and also extra focus on the neck itself so that I really suspend the neck and you get this nice sharp definition of the jawline here. Now, once I do the tightening, that's the most important part. Uh, and then the skin itself just kind of lays back down. I always tell people it's like making a bed. You want military corners for your mattress. So you tuck it all in tight, but then your quilt or your duvet just lays right over it you're not doing any tightening of that part. And it's the same idea. You're tightening the sheets underneath so that you get that nice lift. And then the skin is like your duvet that just drapes over the top. I never cut too much skin. And honestly, a lot of people don't have that much extra skin once you do the tightening of the muscle underneath. Very interesting. Everyone's a little bit different. And that's it for a facelift. Uh, it doesn't take that long. Not uncomfortable for the patient. Um, like I said, it can be a wake surgery or kind of a twilight um, sedation surgery. Some people do need a little bit extra in the neck, 
uh, like I said, there's liposuction that can be done to reduce the jowls. There's liposuction if you have fat in this area. And I always have you show me your neck muscles. So I say, show me your teeth. And if you have these long bands that pop out, then I say, hmm, okay, let me see whether or not lifting from the side will take care of that. Or if it doesn't, I may have to do a little intervention that's called a corset platysmoplasty. And like a corset, it just pulls the edges together, kind of like what we do in the tummy tuck with the muscle plication, so that that corrects those bands. Now the interesting thing about this is that even though um, we study it as a, a one technique, most people with the anatomy don't have the split of the muscle that allows that to happen. So as we've learned more and more about uh, faces and the anatomy, we've improved our techniques so that we can get a lot more result with a lot less work and uh, no unnecessary scarring for you. All right, so we've treated the neck, we've lifted the face and the neck, we've redraped the skin. I put staples in the hairline and stitches around the ear. They stay in for about seven to 10 days, uh, depending on how you heal. Wrap you up in a wrap. I see you the next day. Um, unwrap everything, do a nice reveal. We have lots of wonderful lights in the office, including the uh, stim light and red light, which reduces inflammation, swelling, and helps with the bruising. We've got the V-beam laser if there is bruising. I honestly don't get very much bruising with my neck and face lifts. In certain people, they say, oh, I'm really prone to bruising. Uh, make sure you take Arnica Montana and Bromelin, uh, which are both plant supplements that, uh, again, kind of work on that um, inflammation cascade and the clotting cascade so that you don't have much, much bruising afterwards. Um, and then, you know, I tell people if you're going to be at home recovering for a week, by the time your sutures are up, you could go out to lunch with your friend and most people wouldn't know that you had a procedure done. Now, a lot of times I like to add on um, a laser with my face and necklace. I find that doing a CO2 laser, which is kind of my favorite laser uh, to resurface the skin, just helps to take away a lot of the textural irregularities, a lot of the sun damage, and then it also helps to smooth and tighten that, the skin so that you don't have as much of that crepiness. Um, I find that this kind of polishes the effect. It helps to improve the envelope that's holding up the result in my surgery. Now, in addition to doing that, or if you opt not to do that, part of the consultation and the follow-up involves your skincare routine. Uh, this is a very, very important part to me. It's like taking the time to get the oil changed on your Ferrari. You know, you're not going to run it to the ground like you would with your Honda Civic, although you should take care of those because they last forever. Um, but, you know, you get what you put in. So if you just put in a one-time investment but you don't maintain it you don't take the efforts obviously it's not going to last that long and you know down the road you're going to need a secondary procedure or more non-surgical procedures just to help you kind of regain where you are now the point of a facelift for me i usually tell people i can set you back maybe about 10 years depending on what age you are when you're starting and i'll maintain that look and get you 10 to 15 years out of it. So that way, if I'm 50 and I'm having a lift done today, I should get you back to looking like you did in your early 40s. And by the time you're in your 60s, you should look like you're in your 50s. So I think that's a pretty good um, trade off for having surgery that lasts, you know, two and a half hours and getting a lot of traction out of it. But, for skincare, um, I believe very firmly in retinol products. That's vitamin A topical products because it, uh, hi baby, <laughs> it allows for a DNA renewal and cell turnover so that you're constantly getting rid of that dead layer of skin that's kind of on top and dulling everything, all right? It allows the newer skin to push towards the top um, you'll see people who have that kind of glowing skin look, and that's a retinized person. There are people like me who can't tolerate retinol, and if you're one of those, we can find a solution because I found a couple of products that are really, really great for sensitive skin, um, and believe me, I've tried a lot. So, all right, just to review again, surgical facelift, when most surgeons talk about it, 
refer to the lower third of the face. It tends to um, treat the jowl area and it treats the neck. So the angle of the neck or if there's extra fat or banding in the muscles in the front. So that's the lower third of the face. I like to adjunct it with lasers to resurface the whole face. This procedure can be done along with eyelid surgery at the same time, either upper, lower, or both. It can be done with fat transfer, which means that I'm taking fat either from your thighs or your tummy and adding it like filler to areas where you seem deficient. And this again kind of augments the results of your facelift. Uh, it can be done with a laser. I think I already mentioned that. And I do like to use PRP too, which is platelet-rich plasma. It's a kind of very strong, um, concentrated growth factors and it helps with the healing process and it also helps with the quality of my result because the skin improves. Oh, here's my baby. Say hi. Whoa, okay. Let's not say hi. Shark thing. All right. So I find that I'm doing more and more consults for younger people who are interested in faces and I don't think you should let anyone talk you out of it if you're concerned or if you're interested. If you're doing a lot of this when you're standing in front of the mirror, come talk to me. Um, you may not be right at that point yet, but there are things that we can talk about and do as we get towards a surgical facelift. And I think maybe next week we can focus on that topic instead, the non-surgical facelifts, because those are pretty fun. And like I said, I'm kind of living in that era and starting to buy into those things. But I think that this is a very exciting time for us to be living in. Um, we have a lot of options and people are much more open about talking about their experiences and then also uh, a lot more open and supportive of their mothers or grandmothers or even themselves having their procedures done. We have a lot of times the daughters who come in for lip filler and cheek filler will bring in their mothers because they say, hey, you know, you should have a thread lift or maybe you should talk to the doctor about getting a facelift and then we get to treat generations of the same family and it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to get to know all of you in that, in that fashion, so. All right, um, let me check. Okay, don't see any questions. If you have questions, do please DM me or um, check out my website. I have a blog that carries a lot of um, information about, and pricing and photos and whatnot. Let's see, is there an age where you don't recommend a facelift as in too old? I wouldn't say there's anyone who's too old. Um, because we're not using general anesthesia, this tends to be a very safe procedure. Uh, obviously, if you have comorbidities, if you have heart issues or breathing problems, anything, then we'll do the appropriate medical workup. Um, but we have patients in their 80s. Um, I think I, my personal oldest patient's uh, 76 or 77. Um, but I have colleagues who've done repeat facelifts on people who had them in their 60s and then come back in their 80s and they're like, I'm still doing great and I just want a little refresher. Now, there's no upper age limit to doing these procedures. Uh, I did mention earlier that if you are thinking about it, to it, that it's a lot more effective to do a little bit when you're younger than to do a lot when you're older. Um, the results will just hold up a lot better at that point but it's never too late. Um, we can always discuss it and I can tell you realistic will to achieve. Okay. okay, so again, you can ask me your questions. You can come in for a consultation. We are taking limited appointments in the office at this time, also doing virtual consultations. And um, uh, my website, like I said, has uh, blogs and photos and other information specifically, specifically about facelift surgeries, which tends to be one of my favorite procedures to do. Now, I hope you enjoyed this segment. Thank you for joining me. If you have a chance, try out this strawberry fizz. Um, it's good as a mocktail too. But I hope you enjoy the rest of your week, and I will see you again in, in another week. Okay, good night.